The year 1980 brought a new face in the United States. Ronald Reagan won the election, promising a new era of American optimism. This seemed to be dawning as the Iran hostages were released. But only a few weeks later, Reagan was gunned down. The president barely survived and his press secretary was crippled. His attacker, John Hinckley, claimed to be avenging the murder of another great legend. John Lennon. For many, the greatest popular musician ever. Late in the evening of the 8th of December, 1980, Weeping crowds swiftly gathered outside the Dakota apartment building on New York's 72nd Street. News that Lennon had been gunned down spread fast. Lennon was rushed to the Roosevelt Hospital, but was dead on arrival. His attacker, identified as Mark Chapman from Hawaii, was taken to the 20th Precinct, where a police spokesman announced this individual, uh, Mr. Chapman, came up behind him and called to him, Mr. Lennon, as he arrived at that doorway. And then in a combat stance, he fired, he emptied the Charter Arms 38 caliber gun that he had with him and uh, shot John Lennon. All around the world, millions mourned the senseless killing of a man who, as one of the legendary Beatles, had revolutionized pop music in the swinging 60s, and whose songs were among the most popular ever written. The man whose death stunned a generation had been born in Liverpool, England, on the 9th of October, 1940, at the height of the Luftwaffe's blitz on Britain. Lennon's father was a merchant seaman, often away at sea on convoys. The family had split up by the end of the war, and John went to live with his strict and conventional aunt Mimi. At 12, he went to the Quarry Bank High School. In the Liverpool of the 1950s, he grew up as an aggressive, non-conformist child. Lennon later said that from an early age, he knew he was going to be famous, but not how. His opportunity came in 1956 when he heard Elvis Presley singing. From then on, he was obsessed with rock music. He learned to play the guitar and harmonica, and in March 1957, he formed his first band, the Blackjacks, soon renamed the Quarrymen. In July, Lennon met Paul McCartney. Already an accomplished guitarist, Paul was asked to join the band. Shortly afterwards, a friend of Paul's, George Harrison, joined Lennon and McCartney. The group was renamed Johnny and the Moondocks. In 1958, with a new drummer, Pete Best, the band became the Beatles, the rave of Liverpool's Cavern Club by the end of 1960. As the 1960s opened, old assumptions were being questioned all over the world. In the southern states of America, civil rights marches led to violence. It was here that the man who would one day stalk and kill Lennon was growing up. Mark Chapman was born in Fort Worth, Texas, on the 10th of May, 1955. His family moved to a suburb of Decatur, Georgia, when Chapman was a toddler. His parents often fought, and family tensions made Chapman a solitary child. The early 60s saw Liverpool become a world leader in pop culture. A wave of new bands such as Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas and Jerry and the Pacemakers were topping the charts. A new wave of popular music was sweeping the world, powerfully promoted by Brian Epstein, the Liverpool record store owner who spotted the Beatles and got them a recording contract with EMI. With a new drummer, Ringo Starr, in place of Pete Best, 
the Beatles soon established themselves as Europe's top group. And in February 1964, they confirmed their position as the world's number one group with a tumultuous tour of the United States. Beatlemania was now an international phenomenon, with a succession of hits such as Please Please Me, She Loves You, Love Me Do, and I Want to Hold Your Hand, Lennon and McCartney were established as the world's most successful songwriters. When the Beatles returned to England, both they and their Mersey sound were the undisputed world leaders. By the end of 1964, the Beatles' first four LPs had gone straight to number one in the charts. The group's popularity was enhanced by their first film, A Hard Day's Night, which was now premiered and soon showing in 500 cinemas across the United States. But what many of the adoring fans did not appreciate was that John had secretly married Cynthia Powell, a fellow student from Liverpool Art College, two years before, and they had had a son, Julian. He was also starting to feel trapped and artistically frustrated. But all still seemed well in June 1965 when the group were awarded the MBE for their achievements. By then they were firmly established as leaders of swinging London, the mid-60s outburst of fashion and pop music which made Britain's capital a mecca for the world's youth who poured into the boutiques and clubs of the King's Road and Carnaby Street. Behind all the fame and adoration, John Lennon was becoming increasingly disillusioned with the life of a pop idol. In November 1966, he met avant-garde Japanese artist Yoko Ono at a London gallery. Lennon's agreement with the remark that the Beatles were now more popular than Jesus Christ had begun a backlash against them. He was drinking heavily and smoking marijuana. Then on the 27th of August, 1967, Brian Epstein died. With Lennon in the lead, the Beatles now began to explore drugs and mysticism as a way of coping with the pressures of superstardom. Soon John Lennon in particular would become a symbol of the hippie culture which swept Western youth. And one youth who was to be badly affected by this was Mark Chapman. Family tensions were making him live increasingly in a fantasy world. His isolation became worse at school, where he was acquiring a reputation as a bully. In February 1968, the Beatles went to join the ashram of Maharishi Maneshi Yogi in the holy city of Rishikesh, at the foot of the Himalayas. They were soon disillusioned, and when the Maharishi asked Lennon why he was leaving, he replied, if you're so cosmic, you'll know why. John Lennon's marriage to Cynthia was effectively at an end, and soon after their return from India in May, he started living with Yoko Ono. The Vietnam War was at its height. The United States was being racked by nationwide protest. In Britain, Lennon had already become unpopular by publicly opposing it. Now, with Yoko Ono, he became an acknowledged leader of the world peace movement. While he was moving in new directions, the Beatles' business empire, Apple Corps, was collapsing. Their boutique went into liquidation. The Rolling Stones manager, Alan Klein, brought in to sort out the mess, found that they were almost bankrupt. The strains were too much, and on the 30th of January, 1969, the Beatles made their last appearance together, an impromptu concert on the roof of the Apple Building in Savile Row. In March, Paul McCartney married Linda Eastman, an American photographer in London. A week later, John and Yoko got married in Gibraltar. During their honeymoon, Lennon's political activism was made very public when he and Yoko staged the first of a series of bed-ins for peace. Now writing major peace songs like Give Peace a Chance, 
Lennon made no attempt to disguise his concern at where the Beatles had gone wrong. The situation, if we have the name Beatle on it, it sells, you know. And when we begin to think like that, then there's something wrong, you know. Well, then you begin to think, uh, what are we selling, you know? The peace movement and hippie culture came together as a massive youth movement. The Beatles had finally split up in April 1970, and John Lennon and Yoko Ono got temporary visas to move to the United States. Once there, they were drawn into high-profile political activism. While hippie culture swept America, Mark Chapman was at Columbia High School in Decatur. This had an unenviable reputation as number one for drugs in the state of Georgia. Chapman tried to find acceptance in a crowd which experimented first with marijuana and sniffing glue, and then with LSD and heroin. His classmate, Newton Hendricks, remembers. My impression of him is he was just pretty much a, you know, a, a fellow that stood by, that stayed by himself. He wasn't antisocial or anything, but he, I couldn't think of you know, any close friends he had, or for that matter, any interest he had other than just the music program. He gave no indication to me, or, or I never read one, that he was uh, you know, into the Beatles or into anybody else for that matter, really. Like many of his generation, Chapman read J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye and was swayed by its hero Holden Coalfield's contempt for adult phoniness. But then came a surprising development. When he became a junior, I guess the 11th, when we started the 11th grade, Mark became a Christian. He, uh, he got into the Jesus movement, really, I guess is what it was. Uh, he was, uh, his mannerisms were, were softer, more subdued. Uh, while Chapman seemed to be finding some stability, in contrast, notorious for their political activities, John and Yoko were fighting the authorities to be allowed to have permission to stay in the United States. It's still where I like to be. It's still, uh, the, it's still Paris or Rome to me, like they used to be thousands of years ago, and I want to be here. I want to be able to be here and be in England and France or travel wherever I want. I don't expect to be, ha you know, hassled unless I'm going to Hungary or something, or Czechoslovakia. Then I'd expect it. Now living overlooking New York Central Park, Lennon was often depressed and high on drugs. Towards the end of 1973, the couple split up, with Lennon becoming involved with their secretary, May Pang. He took off for California on what he called his lost weekend, a year-long spree of drugs and hard drinking. Despite leaving school with insufficient grades to go straight to college, Chapman went to work at YMCA summer camps. He proved an enormous success, able to communicate with and motivate the children. In 1975, Chapman was sent to a camp in the Lebanon, but the outbreak of the Civil War forced him to leave almost immediately. He returned to the United States to help receive and resettle Vietnamese refugees at a YMCA camp at Fort Chaffee in Arkansas. In January 1975, John returned to New York and he and Yoko got together again. The final settlement of legal battles over the breakup of the Beatles brought welcome stability, and they took an apartment in the Dakota building. On the 9th of October, 1975, Yoko had a son, Sean. Lennon now became a virtual recluse, looking after their son while Yoko developed their business interests. Late in October, a collection of Lennon's songs was published his last album for almost five years. In July 1976, he was given permanent residence in the United States. Inspired by his work with the YMCA, Mark Chapman had tried to go to college so as to qualify for a full-time post. But he seemed unable to cope with the pressure and dropped out before the end of the first term. This failure to measure up to the one job he seemed to be good at brought back his deep feelings of inadequacy and depression. Back in Atlanta, he qualified on a pistol training course with excellent marks and got a job as a security guard. 
showing increasing signs of self-doubt, he suddenly threw in his job and flew to Hawaii in January 1977. Apparently, his intention was to live the high life until his money ran out and then kill himself. He ended up calling a suicide hotline and being treated for severe depression at the Waikiki Mental Health Clinic. Discharged, he got a job at the clinic as a handyman and in August 1978, started living with Gloria Abe, a Japanese-American travel agent who had organized a round-the-world trip for him. In June 1979, the couple got married and went to live in this apartment. Chapman took a more responsible job at the clinic, but this seems to have been too much for him, and he became depressed and got heavily in debt. Nonetheless, as the apartment's caretaker remembers, uh, at first he kept up appearances. And it seems like he was uh, very well educated, and uh, you could talk to him about anything. Uh, the only thing I usually talk to him about because he would, he would pictures, he would talk about uh, different kind of paintings that he was going to buy or something. But in reality, Chapman was cutting himself off from people and withdrawing into a fantasy world. He took a job as a security guard at this apartment block and began reading obsessively. He rediscovered J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye and began to identify with its hero's hatred of phonies. At some stage, he focused on John Lennon as typifying this phoniness, preaching peace, love, and brotherhood while living a millionaire lifestyle. Then Chapman resigned his job with a bizarre gesture. On the last day that he worked, in the log sheet where he signed in, he, uh, instead of signing his regular name, he signed uh, John Lennon. What day was that? October 23rd. Chapman was now totally gripped by his obsession and was preparing to express his hatred in action. Four days later, he went to this gun store and bought a .38 Charter Arms special handgun. He signed the license under his own name, but strangely bought no ammunition. On the 29th of October, Chapman made his first trip to New York. He told no one he was going and only rang his wife once he had arrived. He checked into the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and went to see the sights. But most of his time was spent hanging around outside the Dakota building, asking about John Lennon's movements. The Dakota has many famous residents, and fans are often hanging around outside. So no one found anything unusual about the young man with his obsession about the rock superstar. To be nearer his prey, Chapman moved into the Olcott Hotel, which is only half a block down from the Dakota. Finding that he could not buy ammunition in New York, he flew down to Georgia and bought some soft-nosed .38 bullets. On his flight back to New York, Chapman saw an article in Esquire magazine about Lennon's lavish lifestyle. This, coupled with news of the imminent release of Double Fantasy, Lennon's first album for five years, seems to have finalized Chapman's determination to kill the man he saw as a phony. Chapman returned to Hawaii on the 12th of November. Amid the pleasure seekers, he became even more frustrated and angry and started making threatening phone calls, often to complete strangers. On the 5th of December, Chapman took a flight back to New York and checked in at the YMCA early the next morning. For much of that day and the next, he waited outside the Dakota, talking to the doormen and other fans. Then, on the afternoon of the 7th, he moved to the luxurious Sheraton Center Hotel. The next morning, Chapman left a collection of possessions displayed so that they could be seen on first entering his room. These included a pocket Bible inscribed with the name Holden Coalfield and the word Lennon added next to the Gospel of St. John. For Lennon, the danger which he had downplayed in a recent interview was closing in. I've been walking the streets for the last seven years. When we first moved here, we actually lived in the village. 
in Greenwich Village. But I would be walking around tense like that, waiting for somebody to say something or jump on me and like that. I mean, people come up and ask for autograph or say hi, but they won't bug you, you know? With a copy of the double fantasy album in his hand, Chapman took up his position outside the Dakota, spending much of the time reading The Catcher in the Rye. At five o'clock, he was able to stop Lennon as he left for a recording session and get him to sign the album. Then at 10.45, Chapman caught his quarry almost alone. As Lennon walked past him from his limo, Chapman dropped into the classic combat position and fired. As the police arrived, he remained on the pavement, calmly reading his book. And as he was taken away, Chapman announced, I am the catcher in the rye. News of Lennon's death had been flashed on television and radio, and crowds gathered to hear the hospital spokesman. John Lennon was brought to the emergency room the Roosevelt site, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, this evening, shortly before 11 p.m. He was dead on arrival. The fans mourned, and many refused to believe that their hero was dead. He's not dead. They're just saying that. Well, the doctor just announced it. Yes, but I don't care. They're just saying that to get people to leave. He's not dead. John Lennon can't be dead. But Mark Chapman's five shots had been lethal. On the 22nd of June, Mark Chapman was brought to court in New York and immediately caused a further sensation. Ignoring his lawyer's advice, he shocked the crowds which had pressed into the courtroom by pleading guilty to second-degree murder. He believes that on June 8th, God told him to plead guilty, and that was the end of it. What form did this command take? It's not all that clear in my mind, but, he, I, he, but it, it was of an auditory nature. Do you accept that he is able to make that change of mind? I don't know. I have a serious question about it. And that's why I've asked for a re-examination on the issue of competency. So you... The re-examination came to nothing, and both prosecution and defense were deprived of the opportunity to discuss Chapman's mental state. On the 24th of August, Mark Chapman was sentenced to 20 years to life for the murder. Speculation immediately began about his motives. I think he's a basically a schizophrenic who has, to a certain extent, lived in a fantasy world for many years, who has also suffered from de severe depressions, and who committed this awful act for many reasons, uh, not the least of which was, without him quite being aware of it, an attempt to cope with his feelings of depression and suicide. Chapman's precise motivation remains a mystery. Many psychologists see him as a man who was enraged by his failure to achieve anything with his life. Rootless and frustrated, he conceived an overwhelming hatred for a man who had become a superhero to many of his generation. Killing John Lennon ensured that Mark Chapman would always be famous. In 1985, part of Central Park in front of the Dakota building was re-landscaped using a $1 million gift from Yoko Ono and renamed strawberry fields. This garden is a result of all of us dreaming together. It is our way of taking a sad song and making it better. May the birth of this garden be the beginning of the century of peace. May the garden give joy to our offspring for many centuries to come.